<laughs> All right, folks, thank you guys for coming. Uh, this is great. It's a full house. I didn't know how many people we were going to get. We got everybody, so this is wonderful. Um, so we're all very lucky to have, and I'm very lucky to introduce uh, Dr. Julian Sivalescu here, who's the uh, Uhuro Professor of Practical Ethics at Oxford. He's also the founding director of the Center for Practical Ethics. He's the director of the Oxford Martin Program for Collective Responsibility for Infectious Disease. He's also the co-director of the Interdisciplinary Welcome Center for Ethics and the Humanities. Uh, plenty of titles. Uh, so he did his PhD at uh, Monash University in Melbourne under the supervision of Peter Singer. Uh, and he holds degrees in medicine, neuroethics, neuroscience and bioethics. And so as you could probably tell from all those various centers that he directs, he kind of asks questions at the intersection of all of these. Uh, but what I find most compelling about the questions that he asks are how, how forward-looking they are. So Dr. Sivalescu has looked into the future, and he has found us lacking. He has found us unprepared. And so he's written a book, uh, some of you may have heard of, uh, Unfit for the Future, the, the case for moral enhancement, where he argues that the challenges of the future require more from us than we have yet to give. Um, he also has most recently written a book uh, with Brian Earp called Love Drugs, in which he discusses the chemical future of our relationships. But today he's going to talk about uh, uh, AI ethics with a, a focus on self-driving cars, which is a topic that I personally find very interesting. Um, so I think he's got an interactive component, which will be particularly fun. So I, I give you guys Julian Sabalescu. It's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here. And um, I do have an interactive presentation. This is the uh, first time I've been to UBC. So bear with me if it doesn't work. Uh, where is it gone? Uh, sorry? We did have it up, but unfortunately, There's your paper. Uh, so actually, this is so. This is really a commentary on the pioneering work of, of Jean-Francois Bonifant and uh, Azim Sharif, and also uh, Edmund Awad, who published a paper in late 2018 called "Moral Machines." Um, so if you could just quickly put that um, address into your mobile phone or your computer, you'll be able to vote as we go, go ahead. I'm going to start off by talking about a quite science fiction um, dilemma that philosophers are uh, hugely enthusiastic about. And then move to the discussion of autonomous vehicles and uh, artificial intelligence ethics. And then finish with a much more mundane example of how we have to make these kinds of decisions today. Um, so, if I could just start by giving you the thought experiment that I'm most proud of. So this is the only thought experiment I've come up that's been turned into a cartoon uh, in the Washington Post in, in 2013. So, and this is quite topical because we have an almost an epidemic with coronavirus. So, I want you to just think through this uh, thought experiment. Imagine a highly contagious virus has emerged and is spreading quickly throughout the world. Um, so it's, it started in, let's say, India, and it's, it's moved, uh, and it's, it's at the moment it's in Europe, and everyone is being infected with it. Um, and for, let's say, every six people that get infected, uh, only one of them will survive. But there's no way to predict who will survive. Okay. Hasn't come to Canada yet, but it is coming. And there's nothing, there's no vaccination, there's no prevention, and you're the doctor. Um, and you discover that there's something that's happening, that people are making an immune response. And you could take the blood from five of the, uh, sorry, from one person who's going to survive and transfuse something in the blood, the antibodies, some other property, that would save five people who would have otherwise have died. But unfortunately, when you do that, you'll kill a person who would have survived. 
So you have two courses of action. One option is to do nothing, and, and one, one out of six people will survive. And the other is to do what I call extraction, which means that five out of six people will survive. Um, so this is the, uh, in slightly greater detail. So you've got either inaction, which means that one will, will naturally survive, or extraction, which means through your action, um, you will kill one person and save five. So which option would you choose? Or better still, imagine that you're the doctor and you come to Canada and you're advising the government and the government do a vote. Right? And they say, will we do extraction or will we do inaction? So if on your device you can now vote for either the extraction or inaction, what do you think the right course of action uh, would be? What would you vote for if you were in Canada and faced with this um, dilemma? So 60, 59, 61%, 60% extraction, 40% fits in exactly with your data on the shelf. So that's very interesting. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to that. <laughs> People are just manipulating the now. Um, but this is an example where the utilitarian solution, the, the solution to bring about the greatest good to the greatest number, involves killing one innocent person to save five other innocent people. Um, but notice what you've done behind the, what's called the veil of ignorance. If you didn't know who you were going to be, what would be the rational thing to vote for? It would be to vote for extraction, because that would give you, as an individual, a five and six chance of surviving rather than one and six chance. So this shows the convergence of two great ethical traditions, and I'm going to talk more about that. Um, Jean-Francois and Azim have recently done a study of 70,000 people with this exactly exact same dilemma, except in a different structure, called the trolley problem. And they found, on average, 51% of people would kill one to save five. So again, people are divided. So what I want to ask in this talk is, how do we use that data to make policy decisions? Um, how do we make decisions about autonomous vehicles and how they'll train different lives? Or healthcare decisions about how we allocate limited organs, limited numbers of organs? Or decisions about quarantine? Or about speed limits? Or about carbon emissions? All of these cases are examples of the distribution of harm and benefit across different individuals, as they make clear in their 2018 Nature paper. And they talk about autonomous vehicles, but these are decisions that we have to make every day. And artificial intelligence, data science, offers new ways of making these decisions. And I want to talk about how it can change the way we make these decisions, um, but also provide us with a structure of people's preferences. So AI, I'm going to talk here about soft AI. I'm not considering hard AI, which is uh, self-conscious, morally conscious artificial intelligence. Soft AI is using decision-making tools to assist in human decisions. Um, and AI can give us data about people's preferences. As we'll see, they have a study with 40 million different decisions that people, we've, I don't know how many people we've got here, maybe 50. We had 50 decisions to give them that graph. But you can get data now from 40 million people. And you'll be able to do that soon, almost instantaneously. So we have, we've entered a, uh, an era of big data about people's preferences. Now there are three ways that ethics is important. It's important in what we put into AI. It's important also in deciding what sort of algorithm or processing we have with the data. But most importantly, it's important in evaluating, especially when we're talking about deep learning, the output of decisions. Are they ethical? Are they right? So their paper is about autonomous vehicles. As they make clear, very soon autonomous vehicles will be almost fully populating the roads primarily because they offer enormous safety advantages. Um, also, probably enormous economic advantages. Uh, and they looked at how autonomous vehicles would trade different harms across different individuals. And I'll talk in some detail about the sorts of, of harms and risks they were considering. 
and they obtained 40 million decision points from 233 different areas of the world that showed robust preferences that people have for saving humans over animals, saving greater number of humans over fewer humans, uh, and saving younger versus older um, uh, uh, occupants or uh, bystanders. They also showed considerable, or well, some cultural variation. For example, people in southern countries, South America, uh, and Latin-speaking countries, showed a slightly greater preference for those who were physically fit or higher uh, socio or, or higher socioeconomic status or um, employment status. And these are examples of what philosophers call intuitions, moral intuitions. Should we vote for instruction? Should we vote for inaction? We have intuitions about that. Um, what sense do we make of these intuitions? So sometimes intuitions and people's preferences directly drive policy. I've come, I live in the UK and I have for 20 years, and we've seen how public preferences drove the UK to leave the European Union. It was a direct expression of public preference. It also influences policy around controversial areas like the use of genetic technologies sex selection being a simple one. Um, the government commissioned reports which showed that there were no good moral reasons for opposing sex selection in the UK, especially for family balancing. But because most people uh, oppose it through a democracy, they've kept the ban on sex selection. So in these cases, preferences lead directly to policy. But of course, so there's also cases where preferences don't lead to policy. This is a picture of Tony Nicholson who was a man who suffered a, a severe stroke in his early 50s uh, and was rendered locked in. He was unable to move anything except his uh, eyelids. And he wanted to die. And um, this went to the courts in the UK and the judges were very sympathetic to his case. But they said, this is a decision for the people, not the courts. So despite there being across the UK, Australia, the United States, Canada, very robust support for assistance in dying. Very few countries, Canada one of the exceptions, have actually enacted legislation that respects those preferences. So in these cases, in many places, preferences don't generate policy. Um, and in other cases, this is a picture from the suffragette movement, preferences are clearly flawed. They're racist, sexist, some would say ableist. Um, and this is a, uh, a picture, as I said, from the suffragette movement. At some point, the majority supported slavery. People like Peter Singer, my supervisor, was mentioned before, would say that even the preferences that were the strongest in the moral machine experiment, those of humans over animals, will be seen to be discriminatory, just as our preferences, or well, the preferences in the past around uh, slaves, are now seen to be discriminatory. So I've heard Peter saying at some point, some number of animals outweighs the life of a human being. Maybe in the future we will look back and see that our prejudices were equally flawed. Another example, I think, which is much less controversial than that, is our attitude to organ donation. Canada has, I think, about, I looked it up before I came here, about 25, million, uh, 25 uh, organ donors per million of population. That's pretty high, actually, it's pretty good. Spain has about 50. That means double the number. That means many thousands of people die in Canada because people don't donate their organs. And that's because people prefer to bury or burn the organs than to save seven or eight lives. So organ donation really, for me, is a pen and paper problem. In fact, I've argued in favour of what I call organ donation euthanasia, where people could uh, have, I think maybe Canada has started this, um, could agree to euthanasia through the extraction of their organs. So those organs could be in uh, the condition to be used to save other lives. Most people find that repugnant. And if you did a survey, I'd imagine that the majority of people would be against organ donation euthanasia. But this is an example where I think those preferences are without basis and should be the subject of public education and persuasion rather than policy. So on the one hand, we have preferences leading to policy. On the other hand, we have cases where preferences need to change. So how do we make that decision? 
So I've been working in this field now, so I mentioned my PhD, I finished my PhD in, in 1994, so I've been in the field for 25 years, and this is the best answer I can give you, and it's not going to be that satisfactory, but it's the best I can come up with. And John Rawls, the famous uh, Harvard philosopher from last century, came up with, in the 50s, this procedure which he called reflective equilibrium. And we've recently tweaked this to call to, to describe a, a practical reflective equilibrium. So according to Rawls, to decide what we should do, we need two things. We need people's intuitions, we need their preferences, we need studies like the moral machine. But we need to also screen these preferences for obvious biases. We need to overcome intellectual, emotional and moral prejudices. And we need to have what he called a sympathetic understanding of the parties who are affected. So we don't just need preferences according to rules. We need a certain kind of preference. But we do need those preferences. But we also need theories, concepts and principles. Theories like utilitarianism, or I mentioned the veil of ignorance, which is contractualist theory, or egalitarianism, or rights theories, or feminism, or whatever theory or concepts like respect for autonomy, beneficence, justice, um, we need those theoretical apparatus as well. And the process of reflective equilibrium is trying to balance theory with intuition. Sometimes adjusting theory, sometimes adjusting intuition. So Rawls wasn't a, a modus. He didn't think there was a, you know, a, an ultimate ethical theory or religion. Religion is another example of a deontological ethical theory. According to Rawls, we need to blend both of these. And I want to give you an example of how that can be done using the preferences from the moral machine. So this is, we wrote a response in Nature Human Behaviour, and, and this is a sort of more articulated version of practical reflective equilibrium, but the details don't matter. Okay, so reflective, e so the moral machine study is actually an elaboration of what are called trolley dilemmas that were introduced by the philosopher Philip of Foot in the 1960s to help us think, and think about how harms and risk of death and killing should be distributed across individuals. So many of you will be familiar with the famous switch dilemma where a trolley or a tram or a, a train is going towards a track, it's going to kill five people, all you can do is switch the track and it will kill an innocent individual who wouldn't otherwise have died. So this is called switch. Again, I did a, a recent study of 70,000 people, and what was it, 80% um, would switch? Yeah. Around 80. Typically, the numbers are 80 or 90% of people would switch. <coughs> so, autonomous vehicles are going to face what was a philosophical <coughs> experiment in the 60s, because they'll have vast amounts of information available to them and be able to make decisions instantaneously. So now we can't just say, well, let's leave it up to the driver. We have to program the vehicle in order to make choices. So in a typical example, <coughs> a car is going straight, it will kill three people, but if it swerves, it will kill the occupant. So AI will be able to get data about those risks uh, and those eventualities. So what should the car do? Continue straight or swerve? That's the subject of their experiment. So in this case, there's a young uh, individual crossing the road and an older individual. If the car goes straight, it will kill the child. If it swerves, it will kill the adult. 27% say it should go straight across 40, over 40 million decision points. 73% say it should swerve. So this indicates a strong preference for saving the young rather than the elderly. So should the government require that the car manufacturers implement this insofar as they can with the information that's available? Um, to, the, to the autonomous vehicle. They also asked about lives, numbers of lives, and I'll come to this um, point in a moment. It's a complicated graph. But the larger the number of lives that would be saved by sacrificing the occupant, the higher the percentage of people who would be prepared to endorse that sacrifice. So, you know, with one life, about 25% of people will say that the car should sacrifice the occupant for the, for the pedestrian or bystander. For two lives, 50%. But notice even for 100 lives, you don't get to 100%. So some people 
will continue to protect, say it's right to continue to protect the occupant. And somebody told me that at one of your talks or presentations of the data in the US, somebody said, of course it's obvious the car should just protect the occupant at all costs. Um, because that's why what you're paying for in the car. So there's not even unanimity you know, at the level of 100. So I'm going to come back to that. So these are the sorts of dilemmas that the car will face and have information about. Um, there were differences between saving men and saving women, and I'll come back to that. Um, the pr whether the person was pregnant or not was a relevant factor for some people. Um, and then there were mixed scenarios and mixtures of people, complicated scenarios. Um, so over all of these studies, they found in rough, in, in this order of significance, that people prefer to save humans over animals, more lives rather than fewer lives, the young over the elderly, law-abiding pedestrians over law-breakers, high social status individuals over low social status individuals, healthy weight over the obese, females over males, pedestrians over passengers, and they prefer doing nothing taking action. And this is an expression of the act of mission distinction that is dominant in medical practice and in life in general. It represents a causal sense of responsibility that we have. Okay, so those were the preferences. And they concluded, I think this is this is a very important one, that there were three strong preferences. The three strongest were the preference for sparing human lives, sparing more lives, the preference for younger lives. And this was a basis for discussion about policy around program, program autonomous vehicles. And I want to look at that claim and subject it to some philosophical scrutiny. Before I do that, so they have this study of 40 million people. I want to just des describe a study that we did um, in Oxford. It was actually a student study. And we didn't have 40 million data points. We had 109. Um, but I think it's interesting and it reflects my experience with people. So we, we had what we call the intensive care lifeboat. As one of my colleagues, Dominic Wickinson, is a neonatal intensivist. And they face this dilemma all the time. So this is a real life dilemma. They have one intensive care bed, two babies that need it. Or you have one organ and two people need it. So we asked people, you know, if you have two babies both need an intensive care bed, and one has a 10% chance of surviving, and the other one has a 70% chance of surviving, which should you give it to? The utilitarian solution, bring about the greatest good to the greatest number, choose the act which has the best consequences, best expected consequences, is to choose this individual. And nearly everyone in this sample said, when the chance. The egalitarian response, egalitarianism is the basis of the English National Health Service. It says, equal treatment for equal need. I'm not sure what the principles around the Canadian National Health Service are, but in the UK it's egalitarianism. If you're really an egalitarian, you should toss a coin, because they both need it, equally. Um, if you're a prioritarian that says we should give greatest weight to the worst off, you should actually choose the one with the lowest chance of surviving, because they're the worst off. Um, they need the intensive care more, in that sense. They're, um, they're even worse off. So what was striking about this was how utilitarian people were. It was only when the differences in the expected survival were almost the same that people became significantly egalitarian. In fact, although the stated basis of the NHS is egalitarianism, it's actually utilitarian because it has an instrument called the Quality Adjusted Life Year that says you shouldn't spend more than 20 to 30,000 pounds on a quality adjusted life year. And the US has exactly the same, and Canada has the same. It's about 40 to 50,000 US or Canadian dollars for quality adjusted life year. That's, so in practice, the health system is utilitarian. So that was chance of survival. They didn't look at probabilities, um, but my prediction is that people will take account of probability in this way. But this is the more controversial bit. I was giving one of my students my nature response to read. I said, look, you should read this. It's a really good response to their paper. He said to me, it's really boring. All you did was say, we should evaluate preferences. And then I realised because at the review stage, we initially had this section on disability that we thought was too hot to handle that we took out. Um, I'm going to tell you about that section now. Because 
When we did this study on the intensive care lifeboat, we also looked at people's attitudes to disability. We described three different states of disability based on clinical outcomes, um, severe, moderate and mild. Basically, it's moving from severe incorrectable disability to mild incorrectable disability. The details don't matter, um, but they're there if you want. So when we asked people about disability, um, again, that was strongly utilitarian. You know, three quarters, or, or nearly in all cases, even when you have um, no disability versus um, mild disability, you know, almost 70% will vote to save the child with no disability. So my prediction is if they asked about disability in the mild machines experiment, they would have found this preference because this isn't the outcome. There's many studies that show that people have a preference for disability, against disability. So what do we make of that? Should we be considering the level of disability in making life and death choices? In fact, the NHS and every healthcare system does that, and I'll finish with an example of it. Okay, so we also found, similar to them, that people prefer those who've got more life ahead of them rather than less, and also saving the greater number. And we were struck at how, this is a US mechanical to population, 109, okay. <laughs> but we were struck at how utilitarian they were. And in fact, I think that's what your work shows, that the US has the strongest utilitarian tendencies of other cultures. Canada, stronger. Stronger, is it? Yeah. Okay, so they, they describe these sorts of dilemmas. Now I want to get uh, I want to get some of your preferences. So in this case, should the car sacrifice uh, the occupant for the sake of the pedestrian legally crossing the road? So sacrifice one passenger versus sacrifice one pedestrian. So. <coughs> Half and half. Well, again, this is a select sample of, of highly altruistic individuals and people. When the first study they did, I think from 2016, of several thousand, showed that 23% of that sample would sacrifice the passenger. So, you know, you're more prepared to sacrifice the passenger. Okay. You're the sole passenger driving at the speed limit. Suddenly 10 pedestrians appear ahead. Um, you have the option to swerve off the road where you will impact a barrier, killing you but leaving 10 pedestrians unharmed. Um, or you can continue straight and kill the 10 pedestrians. What should you do? I've presented this several times and like the data are almost identical always to what you find, in, even when it's small sample sizes. So 86, again, like they're more moral or they're more willing to sacrifice the passenger. So you get 86 and 14, and what did, what did they find? 24 and 76. Pretty remarkable how people's preferences are sort of robust. Should the car kill uh, one passenger to avoid killing two pedestrians? Remember we saw before on that graph the people in moral machines, I think it was around 50% would, would sacrifice at this level. And that's, maybe we're just doing that to make it. Okay, so this is the trolley problem. And this is the epidemic example that I started with. One to five. Remember extraction in action, what would you do? One passenger or five pedestrians. Interesting like that before, 50% of you went for extraction, and, and now 93% um, go for, uh, for, for sacrificing the passenger. So the question is, can you, can you defend the consistency? Can you find a reason? Because if you, want a, if you want a snapshot of my view of ethics, it's about decisions based on reasons. And ethics is like physics. What you ought to do is the sum of the vectors. And the vectors are your reasons, or simple ways of adding the pluses and the minuses. So what's the right speed limit? I don't know what the speed limit in Canada is. Is it 100 kilometers an hour, 110? Yeah, 90 and 100. 90, 
the UK it's it's uh, 130, in Germany it's unlimited. The ride speed limit, if you want safety, is the lower speed limit. The ride speed limit for reducing carbon emissions is the lower speed limit. The ride speed limit for maximising economic efficiency is the highest speed limit. The ride speed limit for convenience and pleasure is the highest speed limit. So which of those you choose is a balance of those vectors. Because what you want to do is weigh the reasons. Okay, so let's, I mean, I, my prediction in this audience is it's going to be 100% because you're not the typical, maybe I'll find one who's prepared, a libertarian amongst you. There must be somebody who's, who's crossed the border. 5%, that's great, 4%. That's all right, I mean, I, you know, it, it, sometimes people say there are no right answers in ethics, and that's a mistake. But there are answers that have more reasons in favour of them. And the goal is to have a consistent ethics. Okay, so here's their study again, and you know you replicate what they're doing. Let me ask you this: on a scale of one to ten, how likely would you be to buy an automated vehicle that always protects its passengers? Its passion passengers being you or your family, even if even if it killed ten to twenty people. One is likely, uh, not likely at all. A hundred is extremely likely. Where, where, where is 100 on the scale of 1 to 10? What's that? Where is the number 100 on the scale of 1 to 10? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's, it's sorry. We're going to divide the hundreds into tens. Sorry. Uh, okay, so that's your spread. Um, okay, so the median in the first paper from science was 50. Okay. How likely would would you buy would you be to buy an automated vehicle that always chose to kill the fewest number of people if it meant killing you and your family members driving with you? One is extremely likely. Um, hundred is extreme. Uh, is, hundred is extremely likely. One is not likely at all. So again, I think that is similar to the median in the science paper, which was 20. I'll come back to this at the end, but the interesting feature of that first paper is that people thought that vehicles ought to save the greatest number, but when asked about what they would buy, they wanted a vehicle that would maximally protect themselves. And this is a classic collective action problem reason why you have antimicrobial resistance or climate change is because what's best overall um, is different from what's in your self-interest. And the tendency of human beings is to free ride. So allowing this to go to the market will mean that vehicles will maximally protect the occupants. And that will have a worse consequence overall. Because the reality is that you can be the occupant of the vehicle or you can be a pedestrian or a cyclist uh, or any of the individuals affected. Um, but I'll come back to that. Okay, one of the other things that I think is particularly interesting in this study, I don't have time to talk about all the fascinating features, is they looked at law abidingness. So in this case, the vehicle can continue to go straight and kill somebody who's obeying the law, or swerve and kill two people breaking the law, jaywalking. What should it do? Right, let's see what you say. Should it go straight, save uh, and kill the law-abiding person, or swerve and kill the two pedestrians behaving illegally? Okay, let's split roughly 50-50, and there you go. That's the data from 20, uh, 20 40 million people. Split roughly 50-50, and people in the southern countries are more likely to uh, kill the law abiding uh, person, as far as I remember. Um, and my memory is it's, it's they're, they're more used to minor rules being broken. Um, but that might not be right. Um, okay. 
if it swerves, it's going to kill a cyclist. So this is going to be a real-life dilemma. You'll be able to pick up data on cyclists. Um, should the, the vehicle um, swerve, protecting the occupant and killing a cyclist? All right, roughly, this roughly back to the previous. Okay. I won't, I'll pass over these dilemmas. Actually, I don't want to, um, let's just quickly do, should, should it save the male pedestrian or the female pedestrian? Um, just to get through this, because we, I have to. So remember that there was a preference for females in the, um, in the moral machine study, particularly in southern countries. Okay. This may be because the, the female is a passenger, but I think there are, preferences to the female, particularly where the female is in a caregiving role, looking after children or elderly parents, and that may be affecting this data. But here you also have a strong preference in favour of the female. This is what I'm going to ask you, so I get on to the ethics part. All right, if it continues in its current path, the occupant will die. If it swerves, it will kill a permanently unconscious man being transferred to a nursing home. This isn't in there, thing. Um, should it swerve, and kill the permanently unconscious man. Okay, ninety uh, percent. Yeah. All right. Brilliant. Next one. In this case, if it swerves, it will kill a paralysed man in a wheelchair. So I'm going to come back to this because one of the most controversial areas that is routine in allocation of healthcare resources is whether to take disability into account. But one way to view this situation is to ask yourself, if you didn't know whether you would be the occupant or the paralysed man, what policy would you want? What policy would you want the car to have? And it depends on how bad you think it is to be paralysed. Um, and if you think that your life would be just as happy and go just as well, you might decide to toss a coin. Interestingly, they didn't ask about tossing a coin, which, is, which would be the egalitarian response. Okay, so I want to look at four preferences. The preference for the greater number, young versus older lives, females over males, and the able over the disabled. And ask which of these should be the basis of public policy. I'm going to apply this practical reflective equilibrium. Okay, so the first thing we have to do, according to the rules in procedure, is get rid of preferences that are clearly um, prejudiced. So ones for which there could be no plausible reason. And one preference would be the pure preference for female over male. <coughs> Putting aside dependence. Just pure preference over female over male. There would be no reason to think that a female or a male life on expectation is going to have more value. So if you've imagined if you, again, if you didn't know whether you're going to be a male or female, would you want the AI to have a preference? I wouldn't. And on utilitarianism, uh, unless you can show that females have uh, better lives, then that would be a sexist preference. So that preference, unless it has something to do with dependence, looks like the sort of preference that shouldn't be included. The second thing you have to do is apply different theories, concepts, and principles. And I'm going to show you three. The one theory is, is the gentleman on the right, Jeremy Bentham, utilitarianism, that says you should pick the course of action that brings about the most good, the greatest good to the greatest number. In the middle is John Rawls, who was what's called contractualist. Um, and he described this procedure called the veil of ignorance, where you imagine that you could be anyone affected by the decision what decision would you choose from behind a veil of ignorance. This is an old style of theory that goes back to Thomas Hobbes and uh, was also employed by Immanuel Kant. And on the left hand side is Isaiah Berlin who was a famous egalitarian. And according to egalitarianism, um, the right course of action is the 
action which treats everyone's needs equally. So equal treatment for equal need. So here are the three theories. Um, how do they look at these four different factors? Now, what's interesting is the German Ministry of Transport uh, created an ethics commission to provide guidelines for the programming of autonomous vehicles. And they said, you can't take into account any factor, age, disability, social status, and um, you can't involve innocent parties. The German policy is actually a form of strict egalitarianism, equal treatment for equal um, And according to that policy, you can't take account of number if it's strictly enforced. The most famous example of this is a paper from 1977 by John Torek called Should the Numbers Count? And he says, you know, imagine that there's a sort of shipping disaster and there's um, five people in one lifeboat and one person in another lifeboat, and you can only get to one lifeboat before a storm comes and overturns the boats and kills the occupants. Which should you go to, the five or the one? And most people say, in fact, in that survey we asked of 109 people, 108 out of 109 said you should go to save the five. Very common intuition. Torek says, if you're an egalitarian, you should toss a coin. Because for each of them, they stand to lose their life. The, the, the value to them is equal. And to give everyone an equal, um, treat their needs equally would be to toss a coin. And in that way, all six people would have a 50% chance of survival. So if you're an egalitarian, you won't consider number at all. Another example of this was after 9-11, a plane went off radar in British airspace. And Tony Blair apparently was on the verge of scrambling the, U the UK Air Force to shoot the plane down if it was heading towards a populated target or looked like it was going to crash. Fortunately, it came back on communication and it wasn't a terrorist attack. But their, but their strategy was to shoot the plane down and kill three, four hundred people, innocent people, in order to save maybe 10,000 lives. So the German government had a debate about what they would do. Um, if, if that incident happened in German airspace. And they, they made the decision they would not shoot the plane down um, for precisely this reason. That even if it was going to save a greater number of people, you could never kill an innocent person uh, in order to save a greater number. So the German policy is very consistent. It's also wildly inconsistent with people's preferences, as you saw in the moral machines. It goes against the preference for a greater number. It goes against the preference um, for younger participants, which were two of the three most strong preferences. Utilitarianism, of course, include, considers all of these factors, including disability. It's famous for being ableist because it gives greater weight to lives without disability because the value of disability is given a quality adjusted fraction. So, for example, blindness might be 0.7. So if you save somebody's life with blindness, you get seven, uh, seven, you get 0.7 of quality. If you save somebody's life without blindness, you get one quality. So cost effectiveness analyses, which are used all throughout the world, include disability as a, as a, as a factor. And the, and the utilitarians are very happy with that. Now, what about a veil of ignorance? Well, if I didn't know whether I'd be permanently unconscious or a conscious occupant, I'd want a policy to save me as a conscious occupant. Because that's clearly, well, that seems to me clearly a life that is devoid of value now. But what about paralysis or deafness or asthma or short sight or minor levels of disability? At what point would you, would you, would you, um, would you draw the line? And that's going to be something that we need large amounts of debate about, but at least at severe levels of disability, um, complete unconsciousness, maybe locked in syndrome without the ability to communicate, um, maybe that is something we should endorse. What about differences in age? Well, when we found the difference between, between 49 and 51 years, people were split. Large numbers were egalitarian. It might make a difference if you're talking about a 10-year-old versus an 80-year-old versus a 30-year-old versus a 40-year-old. So small differences under the veil of ignorance might be something that we don't want to take account of, but big differences we do. 
But what we can see is when we consider, just very briefly, these two traditions, they converge with people's preferences a lot more than the German guidelines do. So in my view, that's the way we have to proceed. We have to use a framework of justifiable ethical theories and try to find convergence with public preferences. So with great power comes great responsibility. And to do nothing is to make a choice and to be responsible for the outcome. So we will be able to get huge amounts of data about people's risks for infectious disease, about the features of their lifestyle that contributed to their disease, um, the outcome of organ transplantation, the parties involved in a car accident, and we'll be able to make decisions instantaneously. And now we have to decide, finally, what principles we're going to use. And to leave it to the market is going to lead to a worse outcome in terms of human well-being. Um, and as I said, when asked about what they thought the vehicles should do, they thought that utilitarian vehicles were the right ones, but when asked what they would choose, they wanted the, the vehicle that maximum protected themselves. So saving lives, saving the younger rather than the older, it's not only utilitarian, it's also su su supported by contractualism. Capitalism in the market won't solve these kinds of dilemmas. Appealing to preferences, surveys and public opinion won't alone solve them. According to rules, they're half the story. But we also need ethics and we need government. So just, I just want to finish with this one case, because people say, well, surely we shouldn't consider disability when programming these vehicles. But this is, this is an example that I had to write about nearly 20 years ago. I was asked to comment on an inquiry to the Royal Brompton Hospital that was brought by parents of disabled children who weren't being given heart surgery. Um, because doctors believed they were better off dying in their 30s um, because in your 40s or 50s with Down syndrome you develop uh, a severe accelerated form of dementia and also at that time their parents would be dying and they would have to be institutionalised. So they made a paternalistic judgement it was better for these children to die of heart failure in their 30s and 40s than it was to go and live longer and have worse quality of lives. And I said that, that clearly was a view that of, of life with Down syndrome that was no longer widely held in the community. It was discriminatory. But I said there's another kind of practice that goes on as well as denying children with Down syndrome heart surgery, and that is heart transplantation. So there's only enough hearts, or there was when I wrote this, for two out of three children, because people don't, don't, don't donate their children's hearts um, when they die prefer to, to bury or burn them. And so only two out of three children get heart transplants. And I knew from having worked in the hospital that children with Down syndrome do get heart failure from their complex cardiac abnormalities, but don't get heart transplants. Um, and a friend of mine was a, a paediatric registrar and her sister had Down syndrome. And she said, I want my sister put on the waiting list. And I said, we can put your sister on the waiting list, but she'll never receive a heart. Because if you transplant a child with Down syndrome, a child without Down syndrome will die. So doctors were making this decision that it was better to live a normal life than live a life with Down syndrome. Now you might say that's unjustified, we should be tossing a coin, but there's an even more severe condition than Down syndrome, trisomy 18, where this child often doesn't live past teenage years, has much more profound intellectual disability. And those children also need heart transplant. So even if you think that children with Down syndrome should get an equal chance, would you say the same for trisomy 18? Children with Down syndrome and trisomy 18 don't routinely, well didn't at least 15 years ago in the UK and Australia get heart transplants. So these are questions that are already being made in the healthcare arena about the value of life and how different lives should be weighed. And we will face them you know, with autonomous vehicles, but we face them every day based on the quarantine decisions. Quarantine exposes people to risks in the quarantine procedure for the sake of benefits for others. So I think this is a really exciting time <laughs> because we can get fantastic data on people's preferences. But finally, we're going to have to come down on how we're going to make ethical decisions about these things. 
And we can't just say it's an economic <coughs> decision because that is itself an ethical decision. So thank you. Um, look forward to your questions and, uh, and responses. So you, you voiced the preference for a fact that factored in opinion, public opinion. And yet, we know that public opinion can be biased. And I, I didn't get a sense of how you would go about filtering that. For example, um, you know, one could argue that visible minorities are uh, you know, leech off the social welfare system and therefore are less worthy of being saved. That could be a bias. It certainly was a bias for the longest time. How would you choose which path to take today? How would you, you know, on, on what basis would you say, oh, that's an obvious discrimination? Clearly, 50 years ago, we didn't seem to think that. Well, I think the sort of work that you're doing here and it's been going on for the last 20 years in trying to understand moral psychology and not just the cognitive biases that we have about statistical propositions, but the moral biases that we have is very useful. So I think that, um, that in the more recent study, correct me if my interpretation is wrong, but they found that in countries where there is, where, what is it, social mobility? Greater social oh, uh, no, no. So, in, in in countries where you're able to move through different oh, social relation, classes, relational mobility, relational mobility. That's it. Relational mobility. In in countries where you have greater relational mobility, you're more prepared to sacrifice one to save five, for example. Which m might suggest that the preference not to sacrifice is a social signaling um, strategy that, in general, it's extremely bad to kill an innocent person, and society frowns on that. So there's a huge um, structuring against saying we should sacrifice one. So the question is, when people say, oh, we shouldn't sacrifice one to say, do they really think that's wrong, or are they signaling to others that I'm a good cooperator, you can trust me? And I won't sacrifice you, or you know, I'm, I have adopted the social norms. So they're starting to unravel that. So where you can find a story that the origin of a preference is the result of not some principled reason, but the result of that sort of phenomenon, in my view, it should have less weight. Um, and I think it's, it's a very complicated task to decide when some. So we were just discussing what level of risk is it reasonable to. Uh, for somebody to take on for the sake of the group, for example, for social cohesion, so or or, or, or signaling inclusion, what level of risk in an in epidemic is you know, should we take on? Some of that might be bias in terms of irrationality about statistics, and, and uh, but then there is going to be a question about whether the preference is biased or reflects something important, and I think that's where the work is still to be done. Yeah, it strikes me that most of the cases you brought up uh, assume perfect knowledge. That you know that it's a wheelchair and not a baby carriage, that you know it's a man, it's not a woman. And um, most of us, and as we observe, as we go around, or what we'll have in AI, the AI is going to be working on confidence levels, not the certainty of information. So how, how would you bring in that um, uncertainty a component into decision making and even into things like insurance rates. Yeah. Well, you know, life is inherently probabilistic, so we like we basically never have certainty about anything. So, I mean, it's a question of degree. In medicine, you will have. So, Dominic Wilkinson, I mentioned before, and I have said you could use AI to get huge amounts of probabilistic information about you know different interventions. So, complex cardiac surgery for this sort of condition and so on. And if you were going, once you had settled on your values, and if your value is forty thousand dollars for quality adjusted life year, you'll be able to decide whether, you know, based on patient-specific evidence, whether this person is likely to, to cross that threshold or not. So in some cases, you will have quite a lot of information about 
lots of things. But of course, there'll always be uncertainties. And and here it's it's going to be a question of the value we place, you know, on on going forwards without further information, which is a value judgment. So you you're then back at another level. How do we decide, you know, how to act in an uncertain? And the same principles will apply. We'll need to have intuitions about those cases and some plausible ethical frameworks and try to make a decision about how to go forwards when you don't know with certainty that the vehicle will kill the occupant, you know, where there's a 20% chance it will kill the occupant and a 40% chance it will kill the bystander. I wonder if you had any empirical uh, evidence on do people tend to become more egalitarian when they don't have 100% um, knowledge or accurate knowledge of the situation? Or something, whatever. So Rawls was famous for this for this theory that said, for high bail of ignorance, we would choose to maximise the, you know, make the, the worst off as well off as possible. We said any difference in in equality could be tolerated as long as it made the worst off. So, a one view, you know, you might just decide to focus on the worst off. And of course, utilitarians essentially decision theorists and multiply the probability by the value of the outcome and choose the option of the greatest expected utility. Now people aren't utilitarians or, and they're not perfectly rational in that sense, but I think personally, um, I think people do give some weight to probability and some weight to value, they don't just look at the, the, the bottom line. Um, but I, I don't have the data on that. So I think it'll have an extended question. Yes, my question was more regarding uh the, the bar that we're setting for AI. I mean, if let's say the driver had the opportunity to take the wheel at the last moment and make the decision, would we hold the driver yeah. to the same standard? So what, what, one thing I wanted to sort of talk to um, Azim and Jean-Francois is the, the role of responsibility. Because they ask this, these questions about crossing illegally. But actually, I think people are going to be interested in whether the driver could have taken responsibility whether the pedestrian was drunk or otherwise responsible, whether it was a natural event, whether there was a car failure that the car can then correct. So all of these different areas of responsibility, I think people will have different intuitions and different theories will take into to different account. And we just don't know what to do with that, really. And so I think the laws that we have were framed often 200 years ago. Um, and people have what I call a causal sense of responsibility. They think that you're responsible for what you do but not for what you allow to happen. And the less you know, your contribution makes to the outcome, the less responsible you are. So in these trolley problems, when they're a long way away, so when they're switching, they, they, they tend to psychologically think they're not as responsible as when they're pushing somebody, because that, then they're directly, and you know, nothing else can happen there, essentially. And I think that's a mistake. I think a causal sense of responsibility is what leads to climate change, and microbial resistance, lots of really bad outcomes. Um, and it's something I think is a matter for education. And I think when it comes to these sorts of responsibility questions, that's going to be an important issue. We accept a causal sense of responsibility in the folk sense, or are we going to accept, are we going to introduce some more fine-grained sense of responsibility? But that's all for us to do. But if you, at the moment, what I think is happening and maybe you know more about autonomous vehicles, but I suspect vehicles are being designed to minimise legal liability. And, and that's a legal liability that's been generated through law over you know, pre, you know, big data, big pre-AI period. So, yeah? Shouldn't you have uh, the randomised option in all your polls? Like, do you have the confident option as well? Yeah, I mean, I was interested that you, you didn't you you didn't have either you know um, a, a randomised option or you know a lottery option. What was the in doubt? Uh, very early. Mm -hmm. like it. No, we, yeah, people didn't like it actually. It's funny because it always come up. Yeah, but people don't really like it. But the mistake, the, the, the reason why ethically I don't like it is if you choose the kind of randomised option, you're responsible for the outcome by choosing the the randomised option. So if the randomised option says kill the five, you're responsible for those five people. You can't say, well, the randomizer chose, because you chose the randomizer, you could have chose to sort of to kill the one. Right. So I think it's, it's a kind of the egalitarian option, right? 
if it's if it's yeah if it's done to give everyone an equal chance, then it is then it would be the egalitarian option. Yes, that's true. Yeah. That's why we asked about lottery in our sort of simple little time study this year. So. Yeah. Um, question about references. So, so the way that we're gathering like what people's preferences are, it seems to ask you what your intuitions are about what you would do in this particular case. So I guess there's some cases where you can also judge that by asking how people would hold others responsible in this response to information. But it seems at least plausible to me that, um, for instance, myself, I usually judge utilitarian in all of the judge that I would act in utilitarian way in all of these cases. But it seems plausible at least that were I actually in the situation facing the decision, okay. that I might act very differently. Okay. Um, and so it seems like we're um, making preference equivalent to what people make the judgment that they would do in a particular situation, which may, I mean we can't run these experiments obviously, <laughs> but it may come apart from what people would actually do. And so it's, I guess, a question of how much weight to put on preferences if it's potentially, you know, those judgments come apart. I completely agree. We're about to get data about people's attitudes. If it's a big data. I mean, sorry, practices rather than just their preferences. So I, I think we should be doing that as well because they could come apart. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I totally agree. And. Uh, you know, we, we just did a large survey of doctors in the UK and Norway looking at their attitudes to the use of responsibility in healthcare decisions. So, you know, whether somebody should get the organ and if they've been a, a drinker or a smoker and so on. And their, their views about responsibility. So we have what they say and then we can compare that to what happens, to what they do. Um, and again, I think a lot of ethics is social signaling. It's about saying, what you think people are expecting to hear, uh, and it'll be different from, from what you do. Um, but even from what you do, we, that, and this is the fundamental point, you don't just want to know what people do do, you want to know what they should do. And, and unless you have some ethical framework, you know, it's just really um, economics. Yeah? I, I think the main idea, like, we should only think that accidents should happen. Nobody should do that. Now, once the accident happened, there'd be something went wrong. And once something went wrong, the person should die from the major role. Or who's even partially responsible. For example, if your car is tight, I'm going to hit this or that. So you're responsible because your car could it's tight, it could be tired or whatever. So you should die. So this is the basic idea. But, but say, I mean, as the gentleman before said, you know, we live in a probabilistic world, you know, there might be a storm when a tree gets blown across the road and you've got three children in the car and the car's going to hit the tree, and you could swerve, but there's actually a pedestrian there. I mean, that's not an unrealistic, or a cyclist. It's not an unrealistic situation. And the AI will have all of that information. It will know the number of occupants. In that case, it will know the age of the occupant. <laughs> and it will see the cyclist. But if you make such a decision, you'll make parents always less uh, cautious of driving in the storm, for example. But if, if you're going to hit, if you're going to hit your children, You'd be more uh, worried to drive to the storm because you will hurt your children, not the pedestrians. Like the, the reward should not be on the guilty. Well, so, but the, but the, 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 the problem in this situation, unless you think that buying a car, which some, which is a plausible position, <laughs> buying a car makes you guilty, and so you know that you're now responsible because you bought, bought the car, and so you should take on the risk. In a sense, everyone's innocent. You're just, so if you said you got into a taxi, right, that was an autonomous vehicle, you just got in to go somewhere uh, and then something happens, you know, what we would expect a train driver to do is take a course of action to kill the least people and then maybe the same for a taxi and maybe the same for autonomous vehicle. It's not that somebody is guilty, well, they might be, but... But with AI, we can eventually make it to very little, to very minor details and we can always decide who's more guilty than that. For example, you can buy a safer car well, than so, but who, heavier car so than a lighter car. It's so, not safer to drive. I, I guess yeah, we're going to sort of finish up in a minute. But I just want to sort of, maybe I haven't communicated my sort of message. You know, there, there are two things we need in life. We need good science and facts in order to achieve what we want to achieve. 
But we also need ethics and values to decide what we want to achieve, or what counts as safe enough, or what counts as guilty. Or those are all ethical decisions, they're not scientific decisions. And so you can look to people's preferences to say, what do you, what do you think, what would you want you know, around these values? And that's important, because as they say, if you don't, get, you don't engage with people's preferences, they won't vote for it, or they won't accept okay. it. I agree with you, historically, is that we used to live, but when we talk about AI in the future, we can always decide who's more responsible. But by doing that, we make people more cautious and will improve the overall. We make more motivation to be cautious. Well, my, my, my undergraduate Japanese student, um, who said my paper was really boring, um, said what you should do with AI is you should make it maximally protect the occupants. And he's no, 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 just let me give you his reason, which I thought was quite clever for like someone who's you know that's not an expert. He said it's it's not the case that the government is going to require certain vehicles be built. So it's going to be dependent on the market. And because overall they'll be so much safer than order, you want maximum uptake. So in order to get maximum uptake, you want to make them as safe as possible for the occupants. And that's why you'll quickly, you'll more quickly disseminate autonomous vehicles unless you're going to coerce people and constrain their choices. And so it's on the assumption there won't be coercion. I think what we should do is coerce people. We should choose a policy for it, you know, create laws around it. But if you're not going to do that, I think he's actually, you know, anyway, should. Do you, do you want me to see? We, we got yeah, I don't want to bore you. I think you've already had one, so I'll give you people. The, yeah. Please go if you've got more interesting things. All right, you go. Uh, so about uh, self-driving cars, I was wondering why you should have a, a common policy. Why do you have ask uh, each driver those questions and depending on how they answer, the policy is tailored to the the driver the car. That, that would be one policy. So you know, one one suggestion is you can choose whether you, your vehicle is going to behave in a utilitarian way or in a self-interested way, and then you would be held responsible in an accident for the policy that you chose. And you know, that would. Are going to be legal policies? Yeah, look, the, the great thing about technology is that it enhances freedom. We've got lots of choices. You know, the question is, what's the right one? And that's the one that, with the best reasons behind it. So it may be after we consider that policy, that's the one we think we want, we think is the right one. But, you know, you could have a free for all, you could have, you know, companies reducing legal liability, you could have saving the most people. What, what persuades me is, I don't know if my kid, well, actually, but, well, I, you know, I don't know if my, my, daughter or son is going to be riding a bike or in an autonomous vehicle. And if I don't know that, what, what policy do I want? I want the policy that saves the greatest number of people. Um, and I think it's a mistake. Well, and I, it's not a mistake. If all you ever do is drive, then what you, what you might self-interestedly want is, is the safest vehicle. But for me, I think it's, it, it, it makes the most sense to have a policy that saves the greatest number, and, and that's also what most people think. So, in, in the sense that you have a convergence between reasons and preference, you have a guide to policy. Um, but of course another option is that everyone just chooses what they want, but then you'll save fewer lives. More people will die. Yeah, So, I work in AI at this way, in my PhD, and I, I'm following your recent debates closely, but I, I don't see us anywhere here um, closing the gap between what might be philosophically meaningful or regulatory text might say and, and what actual systems do. Well, that, that, just can I just interrupt? That's why I gave the healthcare example. Yes. You can get lots of data on this thing, and you can now decide we're going to save the greatest number of quality adjusted life years, and we're going to give people equality of opportunity. I, I see what the point. But my question is, how can we get closer to a place where we have systems for enforcing such regulations for complex systems like self-driving cars? Well, because you don't, you don't have in a split second of making a decision in the autonomous so car. I, I, you can't, you can't I, 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 right? So I've talked about what kind of algorithm 
the cars should have because that's what the model machines experiment. But I actually think what will happen is we will not completely understand how the AI works. But what we will have is a distribution of results. Right? We will have outcomes. And that's where we should apply our ethics. We should say, okay, who is living and who is dying as a result of these car accidents? What is the AI putting out? And can we give an independent ethical justification that? Because what I fear is people say, oh, well, the AI has decided that we can't, we can't explain it. Um, and it's, it's the best way of making the decision, so we have to accept the outcome. But I think if we can't justify the outcome according to some, some plausible theory, set of concept principles, we should question what the AI is doing or what, how it's constructed. So I agree with you, but we will see who lives and who dies in these accidents. But there's a post hoc mechanism. Yes. Yeah. And maybe that's all, with deep learning in these things, maybe that's all we'll be able to do. I don't agree, that's why I'm asking. Well, I don't know. You're, you know more about AI than I do. <laughs> but I, I still think there'll be a place for ethics, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, you, you never mentioned having your machine using its idle cycles to do what-if scenarios. That uh, if, if a car is driving uh, at a high rate of speed, on a road where there's all kinds of drunks spilling out of the bar, there's pretty even odds that one is going to fall into the road in front of your car at any moment. Would the, the car could say, this is a bad situation, I must decide to slow down to 5 kph, so I'm not going to kill anybody in this situation. And like all your examples have been uh, suddenly, out of the blue, uh, unpredictably, uh, a bad thing happens. Yeah, and the more information there is, well, yeah, you can argue in the surveillance state, there's yeah. complete information. I completely agree with it. you. So that will be a dominant strategy. Um, so it will, it will clearly, if you can slow down and get more information or uh, attempt to avoid a scenario, then that will be an option that needs to be evaluated. And, and that probably will be the most favorable option. But you need to be aware of this phenomenon I've seen in practical ethics. When people want to wish away difficult dilemmas um, by saying, well, if only we counsel a family better, then you know, they'll give their organs. Or if, if only we got more information or the, or the vehicle was able to slow down, we could avoid these complicated. Actually, that's not true. You know, we face, that's what the Down syndrome case was, we face decisions all the time between conflicts of values and we have to find a way of negotiating. There'll be some way, sometimes we can avoid that, no doubt. Maybe lots of times with AI. But it won't ever be the case that we can avoid trade-offs because the world by its nature has limited resources. Everything is limited and that means there is inevitable, unless we can change physical laws and the nature of the world, there will always be essentially competition for resources or people affected by, by events. So it, it's, it, it will still be a problem. And so these are very stylized scenarios that are used. And you know, I think that many people will criticize it for that. But what they're trying to do is elicit our values, what matters to us. And that's very important because ultimately, that's the most important thing. Is a life with Down syndrome, trisomy 18, blindness, paralysis, asthma, the same value as a life without it? Now we have people in the deaf community saying the difference is deafness is just a difference. It's not a disability. So the outcome of that view is that you know if you can painlessly you know cut the auditory nerves of a baby or genetically engineer an embryo to be deaf. <laughs> It would be just like changing its hair colour. Um, so you've got to make a decision. What do you think about, is that, is, is that view right? And, I, and what today, that rightness is in the eye of the beholder. Everyone is, is kind of an and, and unfortunately, the problem with autonomous vehicles is you can't, you, to do that will we'll have a kind of radical anarchy. So if, for example, somebody said, I want a car that actually takes aggressive manoeuvres to protect my life and places people with additional risk, like, you know, you, you have these big four by fours with the, you know, what you could have done was make rules that made the bonnet height lower so people rolled over the top that weren't go, didn't go under. But people said, no, we want, we want vehicles that can maximally protect the occupant and 
impose greater risk on pedestrians. Now, with this, you'll be able to, the AI will be able to take, and so the question is, should it be allowed to? Should people be allowed to do that? So I don't see how we can avoid the sorts, maybe they, they won't be the same sorts of dilemmas that they've had in this experiment, but, but there will always be trade-offs between risk and benefit and harm. I think the biggest is going to be between collective and individuality. Like, as you just asked, have the individual driver set up their answers to these questions and have the car strictly obey them. It's, it's a different thing than deciding whether or not you're going to go to war with another country. That has to be a collective, well, ought to be a collective decision or a you know, major trade deal or something. Well, look, so, you know, I, and so I'm, I'm actually pretty, quite a libertarian, um, but what's striking? Uh, the kind of speed limits that we have. <laughs> so people aren't just allowed to go out and drive as fast as they like. They're actually, you know, rigorously enforced limits on, and yet we have cars that go three times that limit. Um, so, and that's really for social signaling. But, so we do impose limits. We don't just say, well, you can drive as fast as you want, or you can drive with, with whatever, blood alcohol or drugs or whatever. So society's always placing limits. And that's what law, laws are basically there to do what they said, is to distribute harms and benefits um, across individuals. Um, because of course it is, it, is a, it is a harm to me if it takes me longer to get somewhere, uh, or I don't get enough pleasure out of it. So it's not a very big harm compared to the risk that I impose. So we make this decision at that level, you know, we'll draw the line. So we're going to have to draw new lines, with this, or we're going to have to draw lines in, in deciding on the outcomes. And so, you know, I think it's a, it's 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 an exciting time for my my market. <laughs> All right. With that, let's uh, thank. You.